Thank you. Thank you very much. And my warm thanks to the organizing committee for doing me the honor of this invitation. So it gets worse as far as published literature goes because uh, on the subject of um, detecting asynchrony during NIV, I think there's probably no published study that has compared the various modalities that are available to us. So most of what I'm going to tell you is a mixture of uh, common sense, uh, personal opinion, and clearly open to debate. Um, first of all, let's try and at least have an idea of how important the problem is in terms of its clinical relevance. And if we look at these two studies that we did in cooperation with uh, Laurent Brochard's group in Paris and Pierre-François Latter's group in Brussels, you can see here that um, in this first study, which was observational, approximately 43% of patients had signs of severe asynchrony, as defined by the asynchrony index, whereas in this study we found quite similar data with 46%. Uh, so we can say that it is a clinically uh, relevant problem because it's almost half of the patients who have severe asynchrony during an IV for acute respiratory failure. That being said, if we look at the type of asynchrony that we found in these studies, uh, the picture is slightly different looking at both studies, which was uh, slightly surprising to us given that the patient populations were mostly uh, comparable. But you can see in this first study that late cycling was, uh, was an issue, where, whereas surprisingly in this one it was premature cycling. Um, the, the studies were not designed to compare the reasons why asynchrony might be different. This one was a documentation of the prevalence of asynchrony, and this one was an interventional study designed to test the um, clinical benefits that might be derived from NIV modes on the ventilators. So I have no clear explanation for the differences found, and I think that that's not probably the subject of my talk either. The subject of the talk is how do we identify these various types of asynchrony. Uh, one thing that we did find, and that was the case in both studies, was that leaks are a very important component of determining asynchrony because the magnitude of leak was associated with an asynchrony index uh, indicating severity. And, of course, the subject of leaks and patient discomfort is always important in NIV. Um, this uh, study, which uh, was published almost 10 years ago, uh, was looking at, uh, it was an epidemiological study, uh, looking at almost 700 patients receiving mechanical ventilations, 100 of which were receiving NIV. And the authors showed that uh, the poor, poor tolerance to NIV was more often associated with failure of NIV requiring intubation, and the presence of major leaks was also associated with failure. So when we're monitoring uh, NIV for patient ventilator asynchrony, we have to keep in mind that leaks are a very important determinant both of asynchrony events and of the success or failure of the technique. So to summarize this first part, uh, during NIV we have two different types of patient ventilator interactions. We have the general patient ventilator interactions, uh, about which I will speak uh, a bit later today, uh, which we can find in any patient on mechanical ventilation, whether intubated or on NIV. And we have those specific aspects to NIV, the most important determinant of which is the presence of severe leaks. So how can we attempt to monitor asynchrony, or at least detect the worst asynchronies, in our patients undergoing NIV? Well, we have two approaches, as has been uh, said before, the clinical evaluation and the waveform or tracing analysis that we can do on our ventilators. And I've, of course, these two are not mutually exclusive. I think we clearly need to have a combination of both approaches, as none is completely satisfactory. If we look at textbooks, guidelines, recommendations, and if we look into our own experience, we can probably summarize the usual signs of asynchrony during an IV uh, as follows here. Um, of course, these signs clearly indicate that something is wrong with the patient on NIV, but they are not necessarily signs of asynchrony. For instance, 
if you have a very uh, tachypneic patient with a low tidal volume, it can indicate severe asynchrony. It can also indicate respiratory weakness uh, or respiratory muscle fatigue. And of course, looking at expired tidal volume will only give you the answer if you compare it to inspired tidal volume, which might show you that there are major leaks involved. Uh, likewise, accessory muscle activity is not necessarily linked to uh, asynchrony between the patient and the ventilator. Arterial blood gases, when they are altered, are often a late determinant or a late marker of uh, severe asynchrony. Uh, of course, frequent alarms on the ventilator or major obvious leaks around the mask can, are, can prove helpful. But I think we can clearly uh, state that none of these parameters, even though they are important to observe and document in a patient undergoing an IV, none of these by itself or even a combination of these can really tell you that there is asynchrony. Of course, this would be a very nice monitoring approach if it could be non-invasively and easily used in all patients. What you have here is airway pressure, uh, instantaneous flow, and the electromyographic signal of the diaphragm as a function of time. And if we could have this picture on our screens very clearly indicating these three parameters on a continuous basis, I think we would all be very happy. Indeed, what you can see here is the end of the neural inspiratory time as indicated by the diaphragmatic EMG. You can therefore determine if pressurization um, ends when neural inspiratory time ends also, which is of course not the case here, leading to a prolonged cycling or prolonged pressurization. And you can quantify this as the excess pressurization time by the ventilator. And you can also determine the total ventilator pressurization time and also look at triggering. Of course, the problem is it's not easy to have this type of monitoring on the patient because either you have to use esophageal probes with, electro, with electrodes, such as in the NAVA technique, or ideally you should be able to use a non-invasive system, which to date has not yet been developed, at least not in a fairly reproducible manner. Now, if we're not looking at EMG tracings, we can also look at uh, the tracings of uh, waveforms or uh, on, on our ventilator screens. Now this is a nice representation of ineffective efforts where you can see these small negative deflections in the airway pressure curve and the small positive in the inspiratory sense here uh, in direction of inspiratory flow. And you can see here that there are many inspiratory efforts which are uh, suppressed when the level of pressure support is decreased. This patient had excessive levels of pressure support leading to increased hyperinflation and therefore an increased inspiratory threshold due to increased levels of intrinsic PEEP. But the mo most important message is that you can look at the tracing and if you look carefully, you can see these ineffective efforts. Of course, I would suggest not to look only at the tracing because ineffective inspiratory efforts can be very easily seen by looking at the patient and seeing that there's an inspiratory effort which is not accompanied by pressurization on the part of the ventilator. But if you combine the clinical look and the tracing look, then you have more uh, robust uh, evidence that there is an effective triggering. Now, if we look at the tracings, and I've shown you the EMG for comparison, but we now will admit that we don't have instantaneous EMG monitoring. It's just so I can illustrate better the point. This would be an example taken from one of our two studies of auto-triggering. As you can see, there is no electromyographic uh, activation, meaning that the patient is not making an inspiratory effort. These are ECG artifacts here. And of course, if you just look at the tracing, you can see that airway pressure was not uh, uh, decreasing before the ventilator pressurization as it did in those cycles here that were triggered by the patient. So you have an example here of auto-triggering, which can fairly easily be documented by looking at the tracing and also simultaneously by looking at the patient. Um, here's an example of premature cycling, whereas there, the uh, ventilator cycles into expiration before the end of neural inspiratory time. This on the tracing, if you don't have the EMG, can be seen by a short pressurization cycle, 
uh, contrary to the normal pressurization cycle of the, uh, uh, of the non-premature cycling uh, that you can see here and in the first part of the slide. Double triggering that can be seen on the lower part of the slide here means that for an inspiratory effort on the part of the patient, there is first too rapid a cycling followed by another uh, triggering of the ventilator and this can easily be seen by looking at this typical twin peaked pressure uh, tracing. Now leaks, I, I've mentioned that before and, and Massimo showed you this slide before. Uh, what I just want to add to his comment is that as you can see here, there is a time cycling on the left part of the slide and a uh, flow cycling, traditional flow cycling into expiration on the right part of the slide. Now on the right part of the slide, you can see that due to major leaks, there is a prolonged cycling and you, a prolonged pressurization time, sorry, and you can see how uh, this does not match the patient's inspiratory effort. Here we're not looking at EMG, we're looking at esophageal pressure to determine the duration of patient inspiration. And as you can see here, this is the end of patient inspiration, whereas the ventilator is still, psych is still pressurization, is still pressurizing, sorry, way beyond the end of neural inspiratory time or patient inspiratory time. And this is due to the presence of major leaks. So uh, by looking at prolonged cycles, and even though you don't have esophageal pressure, uh, by looking at prolonged cycles, that go beyond patient effort, you can detect that there is a delayed cycling and then you have to figure out why most of the time during an IV that will be due to the presence of severe leaks. And this is another example of when you have to look out for leaks. Uh, in this study in COPD patients receiving an IV, um, they, the authors looked at the ratio between expired and inspired tidal volume and at the effects on this ratio of increasing the pressurization rate. And as the pressurization rate became extremely rapid, you can see that the ratio in many patients tended to decrease. And why was that? Because we were uh, witnessing important leaks, which therefore led to a decrease in the expired over inspired tidal volume ratio. So looking at the expired tidal volume is a good indicator of leaks, but you have to look most often at the ratio between inspired and expired tidal volume. And this is what these authors recommended uh, to look at uh, expired tidal volume during an IV. Um, this is a very good review, by the way, of the various aspects that should be monitored during uh, uh, non-invasive ventilation and the various settings uh, that should be applied. And of course, this means that you should look at expired tidal volume as a ratio of expired to inspired tidal volume. And another thing you should look at is patient comfort, because in this same study, the authors showed that as pressurization rate increased, there was an increased proportion of patients reporting poor or bad uh, in terms of the comfort scale receiving an IV. So as you increase pressurization rate, uh, there is patient discomfort, and patient discomfort or comfort is not easy to, to monitor. Massimo mentioned that before, but there are some signs of how well the patient is, is tolerating NIV. And in the study by Calderini, there was also uh, uh, an assessment of the patient comfort scale, and when the uh, ventilator was flow cycled, uh, uh, there was, and therefore there were many leaks and delayed cycling, there was a decrease in the patient's comfort scale. So it's always important not only to assess objective parameters, but also to assess the patient comfort level, if, if possible with an objective scale, but if not, at least trying to figure out if the patient is doing okay or not uh, on the ventilator. Now, is there a path uh, in the future for automatic detection of asynchrony? Um, it's a bit too soon to tell. Uh, this study, uh, which was uh, performed uh, in Stefano Nava's group, 
um, they, the authors showed that using an algorithm that could detect ineffective triggering and double triggering, they were able to detect in a very reproducible manner and very accurate manner the presence of ineffective triggering uh, in, uh, uh, during uh, non-invasive ventilation in patients. All these vertical lines here show the algorithm deciding that looking at the tracing there was an ineffective triggering and you can see that this is matched by the fact that well, there was an inspiratory effort which was not followed by pressurization by the ventilator. So we could be helped in the future by development of these algorithms that would allow us to non-invasively and automatically detect uh, the presence of asynchrony. So finally, I think we really need to look at both uh, science and, and, and uh, clinical uh, judgment in, in these patients. We need to uh, have lots of monitoring equipment. We need to better interpret what's coming out of this equipment and possibly automate some of this detection. But we really also need to look at the patient, evaluate for leaks, evaluate for comfort, and of course look at the classical parameters of non-invasive uh, ventilation, patient uh, comfort, and uh, adequacy between support and the patient's uh, clinical state. And so to conclude, uh, the prevalence of asynchrony during an IV is approximately 45%. Detecting asynchrony should rest on a triple approach of clinical evaluation, leak estimation from the inspired-expired uh, tidal volume ratio, waveform analysis, uh, EMG, I can't recommend that for the time being because there's no easy uh, and non-invasive method of doing so, and automated uh, detection might be a helpful tool in the future, but as with all automated devices and approaches, we will uh, still have to look at the patient and not rely solely on automatic detection of whatever parameters we're looking at. And so with these last words, I'm going to stop my talk here and be ready to take some questions along with Massimo. Thank you very much.